there is no central system of governance for England. England is governed by the UK government, which is a series of government departments, some of which are England only, some of which are England Wales, some of which are UK wide, all of whom are budgeted separately by Her Majesty's Treasury. So when you say you're going to devolve power from central government, where is the central government that coordinates English domestic policy? It doesn't exist. I'm Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, and our podcast today would be on the subject of the governance of the United Kingdom, um, particularly the governance of England. I've got two very distinguished guests to discuss this topic with me today. Uh, first is Professor John Denham, um, who's a professorial fellow at the University of Southampton for English Identity and Politics. He had a, a distinguished parliamentary and ministerial career before leaving the House of Commons in 2015, when he became co-founder of the Southern Policy Centre, and that Southern as in Southern England, not South America or, or the Global South. Welcome, John. Thank you. And Glyndur, um, who's a, an old friend of the Federal Trust, um, uh, a member of the Institute for Welsh Affairs, and um, uh, an advocate of a constitutional convention, someone who's written uh, a lot on this subject of UK governance. Um, he leans, I think, towards a confederal model of governance rather than a federal model, but we're very broad-minded in the Federal Trust, so we don't hold it against him too much, too much. Uh, what I'll ask as a first question, if I may, to you, John, is um, the way in which over the past 30 years, um, an absolutely central pillar of all discussion about English and UK governance has been the question of devolution. Um, do you think looking back on those 30 years, it's possible to come to some general assessment or judgment of, of how the devolutionary process has gone? Or has it been so fragmented and so differing in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland with England that um, general judgments are impossible? Well, I think you can do a a sort of checklist on either side of good and bad or positive or negative. So in one sense, it would seem to me that although our constitution doesn't really allow us to entrench any of these settlements, uh, we effectively have politically entrenched institutions in Wales and Scotland, and they have gained power over time, probably also in Northern Ireland, although the situation there clearly is much less satisfactory than anywhere else. On the other hand, it seems to me that the discussion about what's the final outcome we want hasn't advanced as much as we might have expected 30 years ago. So if we see the devolution debate has got stuck, really, in the sense of, well, partly it's a nationalist debate, partly it's about separation of powers. The real discussion about what should relationships be across the United Kingdom, if we're going to have a union and what powers should rest at each level, isn't really advancing at all. If you look in Scotland, for example, there's a debate still between nationalism and, 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 and separation and support for unionism. But a sophisticated discussion about the relationship between the two is really dead. Within England, of course, there has been really no progress at all. And, and what passes for even the most radical devolution deals in England don't give back to localities anything like the powers I enjoyed when I became a member of Hampshire County Council in 1981. Such was the pace of centralisation and the slowness of devolution. But isn't that something that's quite firmly embedded in the tradition of British constitutional discussion, that everything is done on an extempore ad hoc basis, and people are almost um, uh, horrified at the idea that there should be some overall pattern, federal or otherwise, to which um, uh, the governance of the United Kingdom should be entrusted? I think there's two elements to that. One, one is to some extent, of course, that is true, but it's also true that there's been a massive rewriting of many of the assumptions that were embedded previously. So previously, and going back even to days of empire, the centre only really did what it felt it needed to do. So if you look at the governance of the English cities, responsibilities for energy, for housing, for schools, for health, all of those sorts of things were really not matters that central government concerned itself with. The galloping pace of centralisation and also quangoization and the general removal of things from the powers of people at local level is really a relatively, in historic terms, recent phenomenon. So in a sense, one of the extemporary things has been the accretion of power to the centre in the union state 
in England and then these different arrangements for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So I would agree there isn't an overall coherence to it. Grindor, what do you think of the past 30 years uh, under the um, under the heading of devolution, good, bad, indifferent, ugly, pretty? Tell us. Well, it's almost, well, it's almost a story of four different journeys, uh, nations progressing at different speeds in different directions. Uh, and if, and if we look at the more recent times, uh, the legislative powers delegated to Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland have been uh, undermined by Westminster. You know, the list of bills which the Welsh and Scottish parliaments have withheld consent include various European Union bills, uh, the Internal Market Bill, and uh, the Subsidy Control Bills. So we've got to a position, I think, Westminster, that it must now accept that having effectively, in my view, transferred sovereignty, of prescribed areas of government to the nations and cannot then on the pretext of absolute sovereignty of the UK parliament decide to overrule them. Uh, simply imposing uh, its own policy views on matters devolved is not a sustainable option. And, you know, Wales particularly have to contend also with the uh, Barnet formula, uh, with kinds of uh, difficulties associated with Brexit, you know, had things not changed, um, the, uh, we're receiving the order of £1.5 billion pounds between 2021 and 2025, and there's currently a shortfall of around £750 million on this number, which could top around £1 billion. Uh, if what sense from is, is this unsustainable? Support is considered. In what sense is this unsustainable? Are they going to be it's sustainable in terms of the government finances of Wales and uh, the ability for the Welsh government to make... Uh, 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 firm plans for the future on a on a strategic on a strategic footing, uh, and extent uh, your needs has got to such that the government of Wales bill is currently uh, going from the House of Lords as a private members bill, of course, to ensure that the powers devolved to the Senate cannot be amended or withdrawn by the UK government without a super majority vote of elected members in Cardiff. Uh, so intergovernmental relations need to be better defined. Uh, between the four parliaments uh, of these isles and uh, uh, place the governments, the various governments, uh, in a better position to plan, plan ahead. Yeah. Um, we wanted to talk particularly about England. Um, we, we didn't mention uh, England other than in passing. Um, do we think that uh, the devolutionary developments, which have, we've seen in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, um, uh, are going to act as a locomotive for, for England. Um, how do you see that, John? Do, do you think that um, the, the devolutionary debate in, in England is progressing in, in, in any sort of satisfactory way? I think there are two elements to that. Uh, to one extent, for the reasons that Glyndaire has just uh, talked about, the way that a, an English-based UK government has behaved has become, again, a factor undermining the union. The, the, the devolved nations can look at the UK government and say, well, what is the difference between you and an English government trying to impose your views on the rest of us? So one factor that may force change in England is the instability that that makes inherent in the union. The second issue, though, is and probably more powerful in practical politics, is the realisation that England itself is very badly governed. A constitutional settlement, you could argue historically, worked rather well in England's favour, has, because of centralisation, now underpinned this massive inequality within and across the regions of England. And the thing that is now driving the debate in England is the need to get power out of Whitehall, to let, let local areas, we can talk about the detail if you want to, exercise more power. But that immediately comes up against a fundamental problem. There is no central system of governance for England. England is governed by the UK government, which is a series of government departments, some of which are England only, some of which are England Wales, some of which are UK wide, all of whom are budgeted separately by Her Majesty's Treasury. So when you say you're going to devolve power from central government, where is the central government that coordinates English domestic policy, makes English uh, domestic policy make sure it happens. It doesn't exist. There is nowhere in Whitehall that has the responsibility to do that. There is no political minister responsible for it. Now, what is going to happen 
if people are serious in England about devolution, is that they will find they will not get greater powers for combined local authorities, for cities or for counties, until they reform the government of England. And central to that is delineating what's English domestic policy and what is the policy of the union and having stre- separate structures to do that. Now, you will understand that though you might do that because you want to do devolve power within England. Once you open that debate up, then you're into the discussion about the separate representation of England within the union and relations between the nation of England as well as the other nations of the union. So in political terms, that's where change is more likely to come from. And I could, I could give you 20 years of opinion polls saying that a, a majority, not a plurality, a majority of people in England think that England's laws should be made by England's MPs. They have done for 20 years. And that includes people in England who don't feel the slightest bit English. They still think that England's laws should be made by people elected in England. But that political argument doesn't cut any ice at the moment. OK, but the argument about the way that England is governed is becoming increasingly powerful and central to debate. But uh, as between particularly the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, um, that's a, a very uh, um, toxic debate in, in the sense that, that uh, there are people certainly who um, think that there should be b- bigger transfers of of, um, of resources and um, an investment from one part of England to another. Um, but there are equally people who think, well, not off of my backyard, thank you very much. Um, and that's something which is, is increasingly defining, it seems to me, um, the political conflict between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. Would you agree well, with that? Not, not since, I mean, the, the politics of the sort of redistribution that is necessary over time is going to be difficult for any political party. I think the 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 the, the difference really is that um well at the moment actually I'll be honest we don't know what Labour's going to do. We know what Labour has talked about but every incoming party for, for my political lifetime has promised a transfer of power from Westminster to the localities and everyone has ended up with more power in Westminster and less in the localities. So the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. But I think the the weight of argument now that Whitehall is incapable of addressing the regional inequalities within England and delivering good public services anywhere across England is actually becoming a political consensus between the two political parties. So the debates are more about degree, the practicality, how much, you know, should Michael Gove really be insisting that areas have mayors, whether they want them or not? I would say no, I don't think Labour would insist on mayors being imposed from the centre. But I think the underlying analysis is is broadly shared, funnily enough, by both political parties. It's a question of pace of change. But my final point is this. Central government will find that it will fail to deliver what the public wants anywhere as long as it continues to hold all the powers in the centre in Whitehall. Because Whitehall does not have the powers to deliver. No, you're slightly a spectator of this English debate, but, but not entirely because... He- you think, and I'm sure you're right, um, that, that the whole um, good order of the United Kingdom depends on all the parts of the United Kingdom being well ordered. Um, do you share um, John's mitigated optimism about the way that the debate is going on on the governance of England uh, over the border from where you live? In terms of good governance, I think there's an inevitability that... Uh, 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 there has to be change. There needs to be change. You know, England comprises over 56 million people, more than five times the total living in the other UK nations combined. And uh, as uh, John's pointed out, it lacks a, a discrete framework, national framework, through which these internal inequities can be addressed. Uh, the fundamental architectural issue of our time is that the uh, administrations of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland cover merely 15% of these Isles inhabitants. So consequently, intergovernmental relations across the UK have become marginal to the affairs of Westminster. So an all-encompassing package of devolution for England would hopefully beneficially ensure that decentralized bodies become focal to island-wide affairs. And to this end, any new constitutional design must place weight on the structural relationships between 
uh, the government in Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, and the government in London in its dual capacity, as that for the whole UK and for making English laws. And once I would say far reaching executive devolution is uh, introduced within England, much of the work of the English government would hopefully be taken away from London and sit under local or regional direction, leaving Westminster to focus on its uh, isle wide functions. Um, yeah, the work of the Gordon Brown's Commission on the UK's future and the Welsh Government's Independent Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales are both important in this context. Uh, but importantly, uh, we need to find a way forward where uh, we stop having these conversations as separate nations and work or find ourselves going in different directions. There's a need uh, to have a clear, focused debate which takes account of all, uh, all, all our uh, aspirations and ways of working together, which uh, gives us uh, uh, comfort uh, that uh, the future will be a successful, bright one for, mm. uh, for all of us. Can I come back to John on the question of uh, English laws for people who live in England? Um, how deeply held and deeply thought through do you think these uh, uh, opinion poll findings are? Um, do people understand the, the, the difficult implications of having an English parliament? Are, are you personally in favour of having an English parliament? I mean, to me, I would be very happy if there was an English parliament. It seems to me that that's not at all likely to be the first step. Um, English votes for English laws, proper making of English laws can be accomplished within the Westminster Parliament. And it would be much more likely, uh, I think, that English voters would prefer that to happen than to go to all of the cost of setting up a new parliament with its own separate representation. And so I think we, we need to look at how do we evolve our current system rather than have a dramatic change in the way our system operates. And there is no particular reason at all why uh, most laws affecting England could not be actually determined by English members of parliament within Westminster. It's sometimes called a dual mandate Westminster. And although there are always objections, you have two tiers of MPs, you actually got lots of tiers of MPs now anyway, in relationship to how much say they've got over domestic policy and Scottish MPs can vote on English domestic policies, but not the other way around and all those sorts of things. It's not a real problem. It's not a showstopper. Um, Part of the reason for doing it, though, I think, is that if you live in England and you listen to the political debate, it is very easy not to notice that there are other parts of the United Kingdom. To assume that the debates in Westminster are the debates about the United Kingdom. And actually having a forum in Parliament where England is debated is not only good for England, but it's good for the rest of the union, because then voters in England would understand that their concerns are not always the same as they have in Cardiff or in North Wales or the Shetland Islands or, or in Belfast. And actually a stage towards the evolution of the of, 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 of the union is the creation of a space for an English debate. There are analogies, no more than that, between the difference of the wafer-thin majority for the Welsh Assembly 20-odd years ago and the extent to which the Senate is now deeply rooted in Welsh political culture. One created the space in which a national debate could take place, in which institutions then become embedded. And I think we need to see the process in England as analogous to that. If there were uh, what you describe as a more English space, a dedicated space, a safe space to talk about England and to differentiate its interests from the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, are you sure that that would be a, a unifying factor? Might it not be because of the enormous preponderance of England in terms of population and, uh, and wealth, um, actually a, a, a disaggregating factor, um, that the English would, would take it for granted that their view must prevail? But they do. That's part of the problem. And the political culture of most English politicians in Westminster is that. And you see, one of the things that's really changed over, say, the last 40 years, 50 years since the Kilbrandon report and the Kilbrandon report, essentially the view was if England is allowed to have its own national political space, then it will be clear that England dominates the union. Right. Those were in the days when there was a British politics. Broadly speaking, Robert Mackenzie, you know, we'll both remember with the swingometer, it didn't vary very much between Cornwall, Cumbria, Cardiff and Cowdenbeath. 
right? We don't have British politics now across the island of Britain. The, the political parties, the political issues, the debates in each part are different. And what we've now got, and we certainly have it with the current Conservative government, is a UK government rooted only in England. There's only, you know, 100 majority, Boris Johnson got a majority of 156 in England, which only gave him an 80 majority across the United Kingdom because he lost everywhere else. So what has now become a... what? The, the constitution, it used to be argued, hid England's influence and that helped keep the union stable. Now the constitution actually makes England's dominance explicit and that makes the union unstable. So actually allowing the, the evolution of an English national democracy is actually what we need to keep the union together. It's not it's no longer a threat to it. The current system is a threat to it. Good. Uh, do uh, let's talk in, in more general terms about uh, federalism and confederalism. Uh, you favour a, a confederal model for the United Kingdom. Uh, why is that? Can you briefly set out what you think are the differences and advantages of a confederal model rather than a federal model? And then I'll ask John a similar question afterwards. Yeah, thank you. The comprehensive decentralization from Westminster and uh, Whitehall is now essential and uh, for quite obvious reasons, uh, primarily also to allow local and regional initiatives uh, to tackle the economic disparities apparent. But in so doing, the different territorial personalities and the arrangement for national devolution presently for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and that of decentralization within England should influence how reform, constitutional change be approached on an island-wide basis. You know, it put simply, national devolution recognises that the UK unitary state is a construct of formerly discrete national entities whose diverse histories and identities are duly acknowledged at an institutional level. Decentralisation within England involves the reorganisation of power inside a considerable sized uh, nation to better align decisions to uh, local democratic concerns and demands. So change must therefore take account of these different characteristics of governance. Uh, and in that context, uh, I would uh, uh, throw out there, could we not explore a model where we recognize the sovereignty aspirations of the home nations as a way forward and to seek to work within a robust social, economic and security partnership, which is directed by a limited but mature political legislature Confederalism therefore advocates for sovereign nations, delegating some sovereign authority to central bodies of agreed common interests, such as defense, diplomacy, internal trade, currency, and macroeconomics, uh, with other structures, allowing for some harmonization of laws and collaboration between the four, the four parliaments. Assuming common currency, bank, and market, an agreed basic isle-wide level of welfare support, covering benefits and pensions, as well as defence. To me, it does neatly deal with the tension uh, between uh, unionists and nationalist aspirations. The real need to share some key functions uh, on an isle-wide basis, I think that cannot be ignored in any discussion. And also it presents, you know, we're looking at a confederal isle, a confederal model of four nations, it does present the opportunity for federalization within the English regions in relation to new style parliamentary arrangements for, for England. John. But we do need to look at some fresh constitutional thinking. Good. John, is, is that a model that you recognize and would favor? Yes, yes, it is. I, I, I think it's, it, it's right that we need to conceive of four sovereign nations who agree what it is they want to share together in a union. And I, I think that has to be the starting point. I think if you go beyond that to try to make each nation fit into, a, if you like, a uniform structure, you run up against some, some quite serious problems. So it may be that in 20 years time or 30 years time, there is an evolution of legislative devolution within England. But that is an awful long way away from where we are at the moment. And it is also very, very difficult to create a regional structure for England that most people in England would recognise that they live in. There are one or two places like the North East or Yorkshire and Humberside where that might be true. But when Labour tried to do it with the old standard ONS regions, people said, but I don't live in the South East. 
you know, I live in Hampshire or I live in Kent or or wherever it might be. So I think the the somewhat more flexible approach that Glendower takes, with its emphasis firstly on national sovereignty and secondly on having a serious discussion about what it is we wish to share and how we have common objectives, is the right way to think about this. Now, you know, you might in 25 years time be in a very different position. Identities, regions, new structures might evolve within England, which demanded new legislative processes. But I think trying to make that a building block now when the political conditions aren't right for it, then means holding back all of the things that people in Wales want, that people in Scotland want, that people in Northern Ireland may want from a union. Uh, people who are in favour of the sort of um, governance um, changes that, that both of you are pointing towards uh, often link these changes to, to two reforms, reform of the House of Lords and proportional representation. Um, do you see the two, John, as being in, importantly linked? Well, to take them um, in turn, uh, I've been long been a supporter of proportional representation. I mean, primarily because I believe that modern society is a pluralist society and the attempt to force people into one of two major parties to be represented is wrong. In constitutional terms, there's absolutely no doubt that the first past the post system continually overstates the uh, weight of one political party in England. It actually overstates the size of nationalism in Scotland. So most people in Scotland voted not for nationalism in 2019, but the vast majority of MPs in Westminster are nationalists. So first past the post actually creates centripetal forces pulling the pulling the union uh, uh, apart. House of Lords reform, um, I think, is is not technically essential but there is a very good case for having an institution uh, which actually focuses on where the union comes together. Where I would disagree with Gordon Brown's proposals is that that should be an elected body. That seems to me to massively to overcomplicate the system. And bluntly, if you have an elected body, most of the people in it will come from England. And the idea that Gordon has that they would therefore protect the constitutional autonomy of Wales seems a pretty dubious proposition. But a second chamber in which the nations and local government across the union were represented, in which, we, in which the English structure of government had its own representation, that would be a very good thing. What do you think about proportional representation and the reform of the House of Lords? And we, you know, we need to anything that uh, moves us away from exaggerated uh, results, exaggerated politics, exaggerated uh, assumptions of policy, and uh, moves us more towards a considered long-term view uh, of our of our society is to be welcomed. And I've, like John, I'd be a long long-term supporter of proportional representation. Reform of the House of Lords is well overdue, and uh, again, I share this. <laughs> I do share the same the same position as John. I think it's something that can be done uh, more quickly than possibly the uh, 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 the idea set out in Gordon Brown's document uh, implies. We have to find a way of better ensuring the voices of the English regions and regions within uh, the other nations uh, within in in today's uh, in today's politics and uh, to create obstacles in moving forward uh, swiftly uh, to be doesn't um, that, that doesn't hold huge appeal considering the extent of other reforms that we should be talking, talking about and uh, and uh, genuinely uh, considering yeah um, one final question for both of you and uh, and ask Lindor first because uh, I gave John the first term question at the beginning um, how likely do you think it is that um, the next government or the next government but one, uh, will be able to devote much time and energy to these subjects, given the other particularly economic problems with which they'll be confronted. Um, more generally, is there the, the, the level of um, political elites enough interest in these um, uh, questions of governance, or is it not um, very much a, a second term issue for everybody? Quindua. I think it's a pressing issue because you can't uh, uh, disassociate uh, governance and the economy and other uh, other issues that uh, that easily. You know, democracies within the context of any unitary state are dependent to a very 
great extent on uh, a territory's recognised right to act within a framework of defined constitutional powers, because principles of democracy find the best conditions for their realisation in this uh, context. And the most ambitious the concept of democracy, or even, in fact, sovereignty, as uh, tested by as tested by today's UK, um, uh, takes us to a position where things, uh, from a political perspective, in each gov government, by each government in each parliament, forces issues. So a change of attitude is required. If you decide to devolve, and I earlier listed the uh, uh, acts, bills that have gone through parliament without support from Scotland and Wales, if you don't respect what is decentralised, then we uh, are moving to a position where a call, calls, where calls for federally inspired constitutions and, uh, and other models uh, become louder. Parliaments are created to serve the people. You know, we do have four parliaments. Uh, therefore, the concept of Westminster sovereignty is problematic. And, uh, uh, and the concerns um, of uh, the various uh, territories are quite different at times. And the need for more nuanced responses, more nuanced policy uh, proposals to uh, address uh, the issues of, of, of the time are now greater than at ever. So if we talk in terms of a written constitution, uh, it would give us the utmost uh, confidence in knowing uh, where the boundaries, where the delineations of responsibilities sit between the four parliaments. So our intergovernmental relations uh, can be relied upon to be uh, collaborative, fruitful, uh, sharing genuinely common issues, but also being empowered separately uh, to work towards futures which are relevant to the people of England, relevant yes. to people of Scotland. Uh, I think I'll have to ask John there, because we're running out of time, to um, conclude. Um, are you in favour of a written constitution? Do you, do you think that it's something which... Um, uh, is likely to be taken up for the reasons that I've been talking about um, by a future government or next government but one. If I could answer that question, but do it in the context of your earlier one about whether this is going to be an elite priority, that is, of course, the right question. But I would say this, uh, Labour is promising the fastest economic growth in the G7. If Labour believes that it can get that economic growth without decentralisation and devolution, and also without having far more constructive relationships with the governments of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland than it has at the moment, it is wrong. The idea that we can use the current Whitehall mechanisms to deliver the economic growth and then we decentralise is a complete illusion. So whether people grasp that or not, we will have to see. But I can say that quite straightforwardly. Now, in that process, I think the sort of the big constitutional moment where everyone gets together and writes a constitution is not where we are at the moment. But I think the process we've been talking about involves the continued incremental codification of our constitution. So if you reformed the House of Lords, you would be creating a new legal framework for a second chamber. If, as Glenda is uh, implying, I think, the Sewell rules actually become justiciable rules, which actually lay down in law the relationships between the different parliaments. What we are doing incrementally is codifying a constitution. Ultimately, that looks like a, uh, a written constitution, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not it's not an event. It's a process. It's actually a process that we've been on for some time. You could argue that the Welsh and Scottish Devolution Acts were the process of beginning to codify a written constitution. But I think now the end point that Glenda and I have been talking about in very similar terms, we can begin to see what we are aiming towards. And now you can think about how do you codify the stages on that journey? Glenda, you're in favour of a constitutional convention. Can you give us one sentence about um, why that's preferable to the more incremental procedure that um, John's been talking about? I wouldn't say that I'm against the incremental procedures because I think we're on that journey presently and it does have uh, value. I would just say that it needs speeding up. But however, what we do need is an, is an informed debate yeah. uh, on our joint futures. Uh, and in doing so, we must bring in all elements of English, Scottish, Northern Irish, Welsh and British society to progress a debate that is held together, progressed uh, collectively as neighbours. Um, as I've said before, 
my concern is that uh, there's far too much discussion separately within each nation without uh, joined up thinking. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much. An extraordinarily rich discussion, and uh, I only wish we could have gone on longer. But thank you both very much. And these are subjects to which the Federal Trust will certainly revert. Uh, if you found today's discussion interesting, there are many other similar discussions on the Federal Trust website. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you.